I know that it's very easy to talk about politicians in a very negative way. But my experience has been the vast majority of them get into politics for all the right reasons. They want to make a difference. They want to create a better world. They want to serve their community. And and I have been really fortunate to have that experience. My favorite politician of all time, I must tell you, uh, I was chief of staff to... uh, from Six Story, I'm your producer, Diana Hong, and you're listening to Rev Up Your Potential with Hilda Gann, the show where we talk with the entrepreneur next door about the stories behind their success and the lessons they've learned along the way. Today's guest is the executive director of the Richmond Hill Board of Trade. She's been in charge of stakeholder relations, communications, and public affairs with a number of high-profile corporations. She has also run her own business as a crisis communication specialist and presentation coach. She also has extensive experience in the political arena as press secretary to Ontario political leader and as senior staff to half a dozen Ontario cabinet ministers. In today's episode, she and Hilda will talk about how working in politics has taught her to be a supportive leader, how to write a powerful speech, how the Richmond Hill Board of Trade pivoted in response to COVID-19, and so much more. We hope you enjoy our conversation with Karen Mortfield. So, Karen, tell us about your, I'll call, very rich career before you became the executive director. And I think it'll help us as listeners and viewers today understand where you got some of these amazing tools out of your pocket to help really deliver some quality, quality initiatives for the Board of Trade. Well, thank you, Hilda. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's extremely kind of you to call it a rich background. I think of it as more of a dog's breakfast. Uh, I started. Uh, I started in journalism uh, quite young. I, I was working at uh, uh, a radio station, which was a rock radio station in Toronto. It was CFTR. It also had a tremendously uh, strong newsroom, and because I wanted to be a reporter, uh, that seemed to be the place to go. So I harassed the news director for months until he hired me, which was uh, great. And it was a wonderful experience. I worked at a number of radio stations, always in news or information programming of one type or another, which really was a tremendously strong preparation for everything else I've done in my career. First of all, it's given me the attention span of a tree toad. I mean, if anything runs longer than 40 seconds, I'm done. Um, but <laughs> That's more- how we can learn to use sound bites. You've got that down exactly. pad, right? <laughs> exactly. So, so that, that was not a strength. What was a strength, though, was learning to write for the ear. If you, if you work in radio, the then everything is storytelling. Yeah. And, and that particular writing strength has stood me in tremendously good stead. Because after uh, my radio career wrapped up, and it did after quite a number of years, I, I was a news reporter. I was a producer. I ended up as network news director of a chain of Canada-wide all news radio stations. But when that ended, because the the chain closed, I ended up in politics. And I found that that skill in writing for the ear allowed me to be a very strong speechwriter. And so I ended up as press secretary to a leader of a political party for a number of years. I worked with a bunch of different cabinet ministers, the senior staff, as communication advisor. And uh, always the skills I had in radio translated just beautifully into that. And, and then as, as time went on, boy, it was, it was fun, but it was challenging for, for all kinds of bizarre reasons. But uh, after about 10 years of working in politics at the provincial level, I ended up working in, in the corporate world, doing public affairs and corporate affairs and uh, representing various organizations uh, in public, with the media, all that good stuff. And again, that comfort in communicating became such a strength in everything else I was doing. It was extremely helpful. Sometimes a little more challenging than not. Uh, I worked in, in some of the industries that are fraught one way or another, and um, being comfortable communicating and communicating honestly and with passion made a huge difference. And from there, wow. Again, the dog's breakfast thing. My whole career has been marked by people calling me up and saying, I think you'd be really good at this. Do you want to give it a try? 
And, and that seems to have led from career to career to career. So I've gone from running not-for-profit organizations to working in the corporate world a number of times, working in government. I keep getting sucked back into that, although I'm trying not to. And, and uh, running my own company as a crisis communication specialist and presentation coach. And after all that, I landed on the doorstep of the Richmond Hill Board of Trade. Wow. Okay. There's a lot of sound bites there that, that I'm still getting over the uh, right by ear. Is that what you said? Right by ear? Or? Right for the ear. Yeah. Right for the ear. So I, I want to capture some of the, the highlights. I didn't want to interrupt this dog's breakfast, as you call it. And, and I'm not surprised that you just you, you went into a, a, the news from a, a rock station perspective, I, I think that's your that's part of your roots calling you. I got to be part of a rock station. <laughs> At the time, it made perfect sense. Of course, of course, you know, young, graduated, you gotta you gotta go where where the passion is, and if, if it's rock music, that's where you gotta go, right? So, in my brain, that right for the ear kept sticking with me and sticking with me because I think nowadays, particularly in COVID-19, so many people have now started to do virtual virtual programs. And a lot of that is now podcasts, which people are listening to. So can you expand on what right for the ear is? Because I think all of us as business owners who are trying to get out there probably could use some of the understanding of what that is. Absolutely. Probably my biggest challenge in writing is not using the vocabulary that I have. I, I have read a lot throughout my life. I have a very large vocabulary, most of which is cluttered with pointless words that no one knows except me. Uh, but writing for the ear means writing in such a way that the language is relatively simple the sentences are relatively short and the content itself is structured in a way that makes sense when someone is hearing a story or I, will, I don't want to say a fairy tale, but any story, anything that, that offers a shared experience is part of that. And so you write as if you were talking to a friend and you're telling them about your day or about something really interesting that happened to you. And that's how people take in information. Yeah. So yeah. if that's the way you're approaching things, they're going to not only understand and internalize what you're telling them, but they'll feel a connection to you, which I think is so important. So, so when you say structure, what do you mean by structure? Well, a typical news story, if you're, if you're telling us or if you're reading a story in print, has the strong first line that tells you that the key, the key kernel of information in the story, and then it builds on that. It's a very defined structure. And there's, frankly, a lot of subjunctive clauses and the sentences are quite long. And you may have to read it two or three times so you gather up all the information that's being presented. If you are writing for the ear and, and writing to, to tell a story, then it's more chronological in nature. You okay. See, so you might say, you know, this is really interesting and I want to tell you about this. But you want to start at the beginning and say, here's how it all began. Okay. And that's how you tell that story. Okay, that's, that's, that's kind of important to hear because we oftentimes will have an understanding of what we need to do. But we're but we don't necessarily know how to write that story. You know, you learn how to to bring in a hook, ca capture their attention, but then you know share that story. And I think one of the reasons why we started Rev Up Your Potential was to really hear the stories of entrepreneurs. And I think the type of audience that appeals to this is that people who like to learn through other people's experiences, through those those stories, right? And that's what I love about Rev Up Your Potential. I get to I get to interview people and share the stories that they've had. Let's let's go forward now to your political career. You know, that can be a hotbed of, of information that keeps changing. COVID-19 must be like the press secretaries there now must probably, you know, not sleep well because they're always trying to figure out the story. And I love the fact that you share that when you write it, you need that honesty, you know, to balance that there is information that sometimes may not be 
good to share, like, like, or not good, but maybe of concern how you share it and what you share, because you have to balance people's perspective of safety or whatever. And I love the fact that you said we have to still be honest, you know, we have to be able to come through. So tell us some of those, maybe some anecdotes or general advice on when there were times where there was some awkwardness and decisions that you might have had to make to make sure you stay true to your honesty and integrity? Well, thank you for asking. It's, it's probably the reason why I kept leaving and coming back to Queen's Park. I would, I would come across a policy position that just struck me as not something that reflected my values. So I would leave and then someone would call and I'd come back after a few months so, so that's sort of how I balanced my own participation in the political process, not being a politician myself, but being, you know, a staff person. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I have worked for some marvelous, marvelous people in politics. And I know that it's very easy to talk about politicians in a very negative way. But my experience has been the vast majority of them get into politics for all the right reasons. They want to make a difference. They want to create a better world. They want to serve their community. And and I have been really fortunate to have that experience. My favorite politician of all time, I must tell you, uh, I was chief of staff to, uh, to Diane Cunningham, who was the minister responsible for women's issues. Uh, she was minister responsible for training colleges and universities. Uh, she was also the minister responsible for intergovernmental affairs. And, and that was important to me because that was at a time where we were contemplating our future as a country, um, where Quebec had, had been talking about leaving the Confederation mm-hmm. and the process that we went through to encourage Quebec to stay part of, of this country was, was mind-blowing, where we were communicating with every household in Ontario and talking about what's important about our community, about our country. And, and why we valued what we are all together. So that was lovely. But Diane Cunningham herself was, was spectacular as a minister. She had run for the party leadership and had not, had not been successful. And, and I was asked to join her after that point when she was then in, in opposition. So I became her chief of staff once the party came into power. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And boy, Diane got into it for all the right reasons. She became a politician because her son had suffered a head injury in a, a bicycle car crash. Wow. Uh, and, and that was a permanent disability. Yeah. And she felt she had to go into politics to get helmets or bicycles put into law. So the fact that that helmets are mandated in Ontario is because of Diane. Coming out. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. You know, because I think sometimes politicians do have a passion and they, they go into it to make that change. And to tell that story is, I think, really, really, you know, it's heartwarming to know that people can make that difference. You said she she was really delightful to work for. And, and I, and I want to kind of draw on that because sometimes we hire people and we want to hire the right people. So what were those qualities that, that endeared you to working with her? She, she was very supportive of her staff. Um, she was protective in, in as what could be a somewhat cutthroat environment mm-hmm. in Park mm-hmm. as a whole. Mm-hmm. And she really encouraged everyone to achieve their best. So this is something I've followed as, as a manager, as, as someone who runs organizations in the years since, where I feel strongly that your employees really need to be empowered to make decisions that you can micromanage everyone to death, or you can say, here's what I see as, as the goal of your role. Tell me how you want to get there. And if you've got a great idea, tell me what you need to make it happen. And that's something that, that Diane Cunningham taught me is that you need to, to have everyone working with you as committed, as engaged, as, as communicative as you are. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's so important that 
as managers, particularly small business owners, that they empower their staff to do things. You cannot be everything. What were some of the probably the difficult parts of being in the political arena and and being you know somebody who was writing for for the parties or the provincial bodies that were in control at the time? Well, I must admit that I mean people who who run for office tend to have healthy egos and sometimes are less willing than they might be to take advice or to stick to the script. When I was working for Mike Harris, when he was the leader of the third party in the provincial legislature, I would write these beautiful questions for question period and well-researched and beautifully phrased and all that writing for the ear stuff that we talked about. And then he would ignore me and, and say whatever he wanted to say and, and destroy my carefully planned uh, number of, of steps that would take him to this golden uh, castle of a question period, he'd ignore me. And he would not just ignore me, but as press secretary, I would sit right behind the speaker in the, in the legislative chamber. Mm-hmm. And so he would look over and smirk at me and then do whatever the heck he wanted, like day after day. So at that time, I was actually quite pregnant with my mm-hmm. first child. Uh, so I would send notes in with the page threatening to go into labor unless he, he stuck to the script. And, and that actually was pretty effective. So I think using your power as a woman, however threateningly, uh, <laughs> really has, has quite an impact. I remember another time, I mean, he would do these press conferences, but because like many politicians, he was not born to that. He had had other points in his career. He was not comfortable in front of the camera. And the way you would see that expressed was in the pocket of his, his jacket, his pose, his sports jacket or his suit jacket, he would keep paper clips and he would fiddle with them endlessly during the process, which was quite unsettling to see on camera. So uh, one time he had left the jacket in his office and wandered off to do whatever else. And I sewed the flap shut which he didn't notice until he sat down for his news conference, went to fiddle with his paper clips and could not get into his pockets, which was perhaps unwise, but uh, very effective and reminded him that he couldn't do that anymore. Did he break that habit? Yes, he did. Oh, does he have you to thank for sewing that pocket? I like no? to think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope he's not listening to this now and saying, hmm, was it oh, her he that did, did it? He oh, he did it because, yeah. But we moved on. It, it was a pleasure to work for. I mean, it was interesting times. When you work in opposition, uh, the stakes are uh, lower and mm-hmm. higher than they are when you're in power. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. People don't pay as much attention, but what you do uh, certainly has more of an impact on, on your future plans. Yeah, let's go back to even before you ch- you write. I mean, obviously, you've had years and years of writing. What made you decide that I'm going to be a writer? Like, where did that come from? You know, how did you get into going to journalism school? When I was growing up, my father built an airplane in our house. So the fuselage was in the garage and the wings were in one of the rooms in the basement. And so he was building a plane. That was just what was going on in our house when I was a teenager. And so one year we went to the Experimental Aircraft Association annual convention in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Uh, which is the only way I would have gotten to Oshkosh, I swear. Is that um, where the genes and stuff come from? Oshkosh by gosh? No. Yes, I think it, it is. is. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for that well, aside. No, no, that's good. <laughs> so we went there and the guest speaker was, was Paul Harvey, who was a very conservative commentator, but he had a regular feature on the radio called The Rest of the Story, where he would talk about people who had been in the news many years before, or who had been part of history, and he would present a side of them that you, you would never have expected uh, because he did a lot of research for these pieces. And I found that just mind-blowing that, that you could go on the radio and tell stories. And between that and Watergate, which was sort of happening um, in, in the background in Canada, but certainly still riveting for anyone who was following mm-hmm. the news, I knew I had to to become a journalist. Wow. It was only by becoming a journalist I understood how to tell stories. So I went from journalism to writing, 
which, which was very helpful because for many years, especially when the kids were small, I was a speech writer because I could do it from home. Right. Exactly. Well, that's really interesting because I think, I think I've heard his stories over the radio because I would always find that fascinating because I love to hear about what, what goes on behind the scenes. So you talked about working for a heritage organization and building their programs. Can you share how that experience and how that kind of helps you today in the role that you do? Oh, for sure. For sure. I was part of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the Toronto Centre, which is an amateur astronomical organization, mostly because my husband's an astronomer. And when the David Dunlap Observatory in Richmond Hill was sold by the University of Toronto and the land was purchased by a development company, that company went looking for an organization to maintain the observatory, which is the second largest optical telescope in the country. It it was a a very elderly facility. It wasn't terribly useful for research at this point in his career. It was about 75 years old then. And, uh, And so we ended up making a pitch to the development company for our organization, our group, to to run the facility, which they were were pleased to take us up on. And so for about eight years, we maintained and we maintained the facility and we learned a lot along the way. I don't think there is one inch of that site I don't know. And so it it it's an enormous telescope, very old, but still useful as an educational tool. And uh, we ran public programs here and educational programs. We had about 30,000 people go through the doors under our stewardship. And it was, it was an honor and it was a great uh, way to spend your life. I mean, as many hours as I spent in my full-time job, I would spend at least as many again at the observatory, looking after it and running programs and painting and cleaning and, polishing the brass rails and all that good stuff. And we, we had a team of volunteers who were equally committed to its success. It was quite wonderful. And that was all volunteer work. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Because you're saying you're equally in your full-time job, you would do this. I see your eyes light up, the smile on your face, a little flush in the cheeks when you talk about it. Source of pride, eh? It was, it was a tremendous experience. It really was. And, and the fact that you could excite kids about science and about careers in science was such an extraordinary privilege uh, to be able to turn a generation on to the possibility of expanding their minds and learning something new and, and considering a career that they might not have considered otherwise. I think that's the value of the observatory these days. Have you any stories where some people have come back and said, because of this, I went into astronomy? Yes. In fact, because we were a charity, we were able to offer community service hours and to high school students. And so we had a lot of students come through there who, who were local students who hadn't mm-hmm. actually thought about the career in the sciences. Many of them have gone on to do uh, undergrad and postgraduate work in, in astronomy and physics and in all the sciences that lead to us going beyond ourselves and yeah. seeing what else is out there in the universe. I just feel a tingle on my cheeks right now. So so feel the pride and the and the joy of that. I think when when we as people do good, we feel good about that. And, and I, I can feel that for you and I can feel that of you. So thank you for sharing that. I do want to share a tidbit, which I found out on LinkedIn when I was just kind of preparing for the session, is there's an asteroid named after you. Yeah, there is. Can you share that story? Sure. My husband, as I said, is is an astronomer and has discovered several asteroids and, and was sweet enough to want to name one after me. It turns out you cannot name an asteroid that you've discovered after someone you're related to by marriage and the last name sort of gave it away so so he essentially traded naming rights with a fellow astronomer who had also discovered an asteroid and and named it after me it references my work at the the Dunlap Observatory which is quite sweet Mm -hmm. and and yeah it's it's a bizarre claim to fame there you go 
it's like one of a kind, I'm sure. There aren't many people who have an asteroid named after them. They'll never look at you the same without thinking of a, a, an asteroid. How big is it? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, <laughs> it's sizable, but it's way out there. So, yeah. <laughs> but I know it's after you. Exactly. So let's now talk about the Richmond Hill Board of Trade. Yes. You you were approached to to apply for the position and 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 you actually got the position. So tell us particularly some of the, the achievements that you've done and and we'll talk about generalized first and then let's dive into COVID-19. Mm-hmm. Well, it's it's been wonderful. I, I really enjoy this. It is great. And again, it was one of those experiences where someone called up and said, I think you'd be really good at this. And I had a number of phone calls when the position became open three years ago. I had a number of phone calls from people who I'd known in Richmond Hill over the years saying, you really need to apply for this. It sounds like a good fit for you. And and so I did. I threw my hat into the ring. And, and the interview process was really interesting. I I tend to be, I mean, what you see is what you get. And what you see may not always be as corporate as you might expect, given my background. Um, But aside from hiding my tattoos during the interview process in the first year of the job, I was pretty open about who I am and and the the level of autonomy that I was looking for and, and the type of relationship I wanted with my staff. And the board was really supportive and and understood the vision that I brought to the role and the vision being that we find ways to make the Board of Trade more relevant, more effective on behalf of a small business in Richmond Hill and and to offer new ways of doing old things in order to uh, to better serve people. So tell us now how COVID-19 hit. How did you and the Richmond Hill Board of Trade adapt to COVID-19 in such a way that you really helped the entrepreneurs and the people that are members of the the Board of Trade? We were very fortunate with the timing. Many chambers of commerce and boards of trade had a huge struggle because they had major events planned that they had to shut down. Mm -hmm. You recall March arrived and then everything went sideways. Our yep. Business Achievement Awards, which is our big event of the year, was completed days before everything started to shut down. We were handshake free, but that's about it. And then clearly you could see that we were headed into some very dark days. And at that point, we didn't know what level of support the, the various governments would offer. We didn't know how bad it would be, how long it would be, what the impact was. I mean, this is not something that has, has that we've had to experience in our generation, yeah, or yeah. even in, in previous generations. You know, within you know anyone who's living now within their lifetime, so it was all new ground. And what seemed to be important very quickly was we needed to be able to communicate with our members and support them, especially during a time when there was so much uncertainty, and no one knew from one day to the next what help was out there, what the requirements would be of these businesses, and and how people would survive the experience. So again, I come back to my board of directors, which is super supportive. I mean, they were very quick to say, let's have a special meeting and talk about this. And we talked about how we could move forward as an organization, even without the networking that we're famous for and the, the personal contact that is sort of a hallmark of of chambers of commerce and boards of trade. And so we came up with a plan that involved communicating and sharing information. So we pivoted into an organization that instead of having business at breakfast and business after five and and all the good stuff we were doing before, it was pure information. It was putting decision makers and keepers of information in front of our members every week over and over again. And so we had all our local uh, politicians with the freshest information they've been able to gather Mm -hmm. from their governments. We had uh, the finance minister, which was terrific, uh, who came and spoke to our members. Again, all virtually, we were very quick to adopt uh, Zoom calls 
as, as a way to communicate out to a large group. We, we were professional enough at using Zoom to its full capability early enough that we were asked by, by local politicians to run their events for them. So a lot of expertise there. We could not get information out fast enough to satisfy people. We created new websites, shop local website, new sections on our, our main website that dealt specifically with here's where you go to find the information you need about grants, about current government policies, about next steps. So all that stuff was available very, very quickly. And in the course of two and a half months, we, we did uh, dozens of events. Uh, so it, we became must appear locations for, for a lot of our, our local political leaders where yeah, yeah. we knew we were doing an information based, based piece every week and a talk to your local leaders uh, mm-hmm. piece every single week. I think the other thing too, is you did things that helped the members as well with finding things. You- yes. I mean, one of the, the coolest things we did, I'm, I'm very proud of this is uh, we went to our colleagues, uh, our fellow chambers of commerce and boards of trade across York region. And we said, let's put together a PPE guide. So personal protective equipment, yeah. every local supplier uh, so that our businesses know where to go to find stuff to stay in business. And so we pulled it all together. We were the, the coordinator of all the information and we created a PPE guide that was broken out by a municipality across York region. It was available online. It was updated every two weeks until we felt we'd captured everything we were yeah. going to capture. Yeah. And because it became an important resource for businesses. Oh, for sure. Because like so many people were trying to open back up particularly, you know, the restaurant business, the hair, like hair salons, and then just people in general who, you know, had their bookkeeping business, they had to find the PPEs. I've been looking for alcohol because we need alcohol for my daughter, 70%. I cannot find it anywhere. I mean, I I found it online and then my my daughter says, maybe that's made in a a place where it's really not 70% alcohol. So she wasn't trusting it. Uh, So I, she only wanted me to buy it from our local shoppers drug mart. And I have not been able to find 70% since March and I've needed it. You and I should talk after this. (laughs) Right. I I need to buy by bulk now. Right. So yes, we will talk after, but I felt for the business owners, you guys provided that level of service, even down to the PPE level. I was so proud of what I saw. I know even during the early days, I started my own webinar series on what it's called COVID-19 tough decisions for business owners. Started with twice a week. I know, I'm a fan. I, the amount of information that I had to learn from the government every every other day and interpret it for the listeners was like, oh. <laughs> and then finally I said, I'm getting tired. After five weeks, I said, let's just do one a week. And now we're down to two a week and still helping. Uh, but I remember reaching out to the board and said, here, this is me. This is who I am. I, you know, I'm an expert in terms of business and understanding business and human resources. You know, do you, do you need me? And of course, you're scrambling for things. Yeah, Kilda, come on and talk. You know, <laughs> yeah. and talk about this. And so, I think. Well, you were such a great resource throughout this process. I mean, it was it was an honor to to point people in your direction. And say, here's another place you can learn what you need to know. Yeah, but I think it's just so important for all of us to be helping. And you're right. I mean, SARS came, but SARS was like. In hindsight, SARS was nothing because it was, it was, well, I, I, that's disrespectful. It wasn't, it was relatively minor compared to what we're in now because this is global. This is affecting everybody, both in their business life, in their personal life. I mean, Thanksgiving, all the little birds were gone by Thursday. I didn't get to the store till Thursday. I had a big 17 pounder, but at least we have five people. My husband and I are having our fourth version of turkey tonight. So this dates this <laughs> this uh, this session, but that's that was what happened in our Thanksgiving weekend. So, but I really, really feel that the Richmond Hill Board of Trade really, really helped their memberships. I can't speak for other boards of trades because they don't have that experience, but very proud of what uh, the board had, had done for that. So well, we were really pleased to to provide guidance and perhaps a bit of inspiration to some other boards that were 
looking for a way to better serve their members. Yeah, so yeah. I think that because we were able to to move quite quickly to this online model, we were able to act as sort of a best practice. Model yeah, yeah. And, and I think that speaks to your vast experience. And I think that sometimes people who've had broader pieces of experiences in various industries and in various backgrounds, the theme, the theme is about writing for you and, and, and those people really are able to think more creatively and, and create value for where they are. So you mentioned you had your own business. So, so the entrepreneurs that are listening will want to know a little bit more about that too, before we finish off our conversation today. Well, crisis communication and, and presentation coaching. So companies or organizations that, that were facing a, a difficult situation and, and didn't know how to A, resolve it or B, talk about it would call me. And uh, it was my pleasure to, to be able to offer some advice on better ways to, to deal with issues. I mean, one of my pleasures was the fact that I know so many people, mm-hmm. which is great. So often if a company had, uh, had uh, a concern, maybe they'd had, they'd had something difficult happen, something bad, and, and they, they knew they had to talk about it, but didn't know how to talk about it, they would turn to me. And uh, I was I was able to suggest ways for them to be honest, which was always key for me. They had to be honest with anyone they were talking to, but they had to look at what they were saying, and how they were saying it. So for example, if, if uh, a company was facing a crisis because a product they, they put out there had to be recalled because it, uh, it, it was contaminated or something, then we would talk about the fact that this is something that it's all companies at one time or another, but let's talk about the the measures that are taken on a daily basis to ensure that the, the finest health standards are met, for example. Mm-hmm. So you find ways to, to sort of put your particular issue in a broader context. So it was that. And I would also work with people and offer them some advice on how to communicate more effectively, how to speak uh, to the camera, how to give presentations or speeches in a way that allowed them to connect with their audience and not have them like staring down at a page and staring at something and just like spitting words out that meant nothing to them or the people they were addressing. So that kind of thing kept me busy. And it was a natural offshoot of what I'd been doing all along, yeah. which is A, helping people and B, communicating. What made you decide to start that business? Well, it, it, at the, I keep coming back to it. I mean, it does tend to sort of pop up in between corporate roles. And uh, I started because I had young children yeah. and I did not want to be in an office eight or 10 hours a day and away from them. Mm-hmm. And it was something that allowed me to work from home mostly. So mm-hmm. I think COVID is an extension of what I've been doing on and off for, for much of my career where people work from home and I am happy to do that. I mean, there was a time when I was uh, writing speeches with young children at home. And the only thing they got me out of there and back into an office is that the only thing I could write in was a pair of pink Scotty dog pajamas. And when the pajamas wore off, wore out, off I went back to an office. Those pajamas are nothing. <laughs> well, it has been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, I think that those who have listened understand that sometimes we, we have an eclectic collection of experiences, but... All of those add to the richness of who we are, who we become. And when we find that job, the next job, we bring all of those experiences to that. Everything has value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I remember reading an article about Chris Hadfield and he said, I'd like to think that everything that I've done before has brought me to where I am today. And I thought, that's true. Like I do have an eclectic background as well. And I think yeah, everything I used helped my husband and I when we had our business iTrends and everything post that has really helped me to build the company that I have that you know supports the HR but understands the strategy and the business operations because 
that's who I was when I we had our engineering company. I was the ops person. You know, I made the, the operations run smoothly while the engineers made sure the business kind of get the revenue and expanding. So what you have done for the membership, I say on behalf of all of us as members of Richmond Hill Board of Trade, thank you. Thank you for your experience, for your richness. How do people get a hold of you, Karen? You can always find me on LinkedIn or through the Board of Trade. And the Board of Trade's website is uh, pretty straightforward. We always have great stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for very, very much for, you know, taking time from your COVID busyness to uh, come and join us on Rev Up Your Potential. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Hilda. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>